before we get into the background on this band and this artist, we are going to do our favorite segment, which is Marilyn Manson by the numbers. So the first number that we are going to throw out there is over 50 million, which is the number of records that Marilyn Manson, the band has sold, wow. which is that's, that's a, a fucking hell of a career, record. man. It's unassailable. I mean, say, yeah, yeah. say what yeah. you will. Yeah. He has accomplished his mission, and I guess yeah. kudos to you for doing that. He probably he probably got a buck a pop, you know? Yeah. Or, you know, I'm sure he was making cents. tons of money off of those tours. Well, I don't know if he's getting a buck a pop. He's probably paying that in now. He's <laughs> right, right. also paying that out to the Eurythmics for a lot of those oh, sales. Yeah, right, so, right. Yeah. The next number that we're going to touch on is 99. That is the number of tracks, quote unquote, on this album. Now, 82 of those tracks are silence. And if they just pumped that number up to the mid 90s, I would have liked this album a whole lot more. <laughs> the next number. I gotta love the CD era, you know. Gotta to love those, the CD. Uh, so, wait, so, wait, when, so when you play the CD, it would be like one, two, and skip all these empty songs? Yes. Yeah. That's um, obnoxious. So, they'd all be so a couple of seconds like a, long. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so then you, you would have to manually click, 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 right, to get exactly. forward to the <laughs> secret track at the I end. I think I'd rather listen to the empty tracks than this album again. <laughs> 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 All right. The next number that we are going to throw out is 97, which is the total number of murders that the serial killers whose names are used by the band committed. Now, the naming convention that members of this band used all the way up until midway through making this album was they chose an iconic female star and they paired it for a first name and they paired it with the last name of a serial killer. And so, wow. you know, you got Marilyn Manson. Woo. Well done. Crazy. Yeah. You got Twiggy Ramirez, Daisy Berkowitz, Madonna, Wayne Gacy and Ginger fish. <laughs> Oh, God. I so, feel like the Madonna one is like um, <laughs> some guy comes out of his office and be like, oh, I got one. I got one, guys. Yeah, Check totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a at one of the recording studios that Rob and I go to in the city, the guy who ends up engineering and helping produce our, the albums we make with him has a list on the refrigerator of all of the different band names that his band had thrown out to try to come up with their name, which is Terry Gross, which is actually kind of a cool band name. Um, but I picture it being like that. Like they just have this list of all these different serial killer names <laughs> with like, you know, pop stars attached to them. Beyonce Dahmer. Let's go yeah. with that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the next number we are going to throw out there is zero. That is. Good seconds number... of music on this album. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> sorry, sorry, at least sorry. 45 seconds of good music on this album. Uh, no, zero <laughs> is the number of shows played or songs recorded when Marilyn Manson got their first write-up, which was a two-page write-up with photos in a magazine. No songs recorded. No shows played. Two-page write-up with photos. <laughs> Who were they paying for that? Like, what? What's the right? Oh, there? We'll we'll get to it. There's there's All a right. there's a reason for it. And then the last number, which is the number that is going to allow me to just unceremoniously shit all over Marilyn Manson, the artist, and this album in general, is five, which is the number of women who have filed suit against Marilyn Manson alleging sexual misconduct, including one who was a minor at the time of the alleged. Uh. So if you had any, like, I remember on the Kid Rock episode, I did a segment where I was like, a couple of Kid Rock fuck you facts and a couple of Kid Rock you're kind of okay facts. Yeah, I have yeah. no Marilyn Manson you're kind of okay facts. <laughs> this is all just fuck you, Marilyn Manson. And That's I don't really feel bad funny. about it at all. I told my wife that we were doing Marilyn Manson and she's like, oh, like, are you guys going to cover all the stuff that he did? I was like, what are you talking about? So now I'm waiting, Tom, you're going to enlighten me. So already. this, we're this getting all some... happened later. We're not going to get into the sexual oh, okay, okay, conduct okay. stuff that i feel is let's go let's go let's go victim by victim yeah right Just i mean i have an article pulled up that is literally called timeline of Marilyn manson abuse allegations <laughs> oh my god but this is already going to be enough of a bummer ass episode with the <laughs> album that we have we don't need to go into it so yes. all right all right 
we are going to move on. I will throw out one more number, which is every single one of you, which is all of you listeners. Thank you so much for listening to our show. We have a ton of fun doing it. We are glad that we get emails and comments from people that have a ton of fun listening to this show. We thank you so much for listening in. If you want to help support this podcast, you can tell a friend about it. We actually have had a couple of people write in and say, hey, my friend told me about this podcast and now yeah. I love it. That is That warms our cold dead hearts and we really do appreciate it. <laughs> Another thing you can do is we do have a Patreon. If you want to hop on over to our Patreon and join for free, you can always in, participate in some of the conversations that we have going on there. You can join at a $5 a month level. It's going to get you access to all kinds of great content. We have our Guilty Pleasures episodes up there. We have our 70s one-hit wonder song battle episodes up there. A lot of fun. Those episodes, we tend to kind of record them all at once. And so at the end of it, we've been recording for like four hours. And we get real loopy and chippy, and it's really fun. <laughs> so I would recommend it's checking great. them out. Yes. They do, but before the ultimate experience, you should listen to them all in once so you can come along yeah, the right. and watch it, <laughs> right. and watch it in real time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Binge. So we are going to get into the background leading up to this album. But first thing, it is important that there are two distinct entities that we are talking about here. There is Marilyn Manson, the artist, and he is the front man for Marilyn Manson, the band. Marilyn Manson, the band, was formed in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's always fucking Florida. In 1989. <laughs> Florida man. <laughs> Marilyn Manson, the performer, is the stage name for one Brian Hugh Warner. And to make sure we don't get confused while telling the story, I'm going to be exclusively calling him Brian from here on yes. out, which I'm sure he's going to fucking hate. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So Brian was born... <laughs> January 5th, 1969, grew up in Canton, Ohio, the only child of Barbara and Hugh Warner. Everyone says that he was a shy kid, wasn't very popular, didn't have a lot of friends, didn't go out that much, super into like drawing, poetry, stories. Now, Brian's household wasn't the happiest. When he was very young, Jogger. his father would terribly abuse his mother. He was an alcoholic, oh, would geez. disappear for months at a time. His mother would often have to resort to prostitution to put food on the table. And that is all bullshit. <laughs> he came from a very stable and loving household. His mom was oh, described God. as a super <laughs> wholesome June Cleaver type. And they actually lived in a duplex right next to his grandparents. And so he was the only child with his parents' loving, super supportive <laughs> family and grandparents doting on him constantly. Boiled and somehow boy. he fucking turns into this. I don't understand. I, I, was, I was wondering because I was ready to have my assumptions, you know, sort of challenge there. I, I've just always assumed that this, the whole persona thing, and I still don't know a ton about his upbringing, but I always assumed it was fake. It was sort of back to the Kid Rock thing where it's like, I'm straight out the trailer park. No, you're actually from like a very well-to-do family. And so I, not that you have to endure suffering to be angry or have a point of view against, you know, the societal systems, but it's, I put it this way. I'm not surprised that a, a lot of this was probably kind of manufactured in a way. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I came away with an appreciation after having done the research here. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. This album, I think it was supposed to come across as angry and edgy. And it really just came across as a scream for attention from an angsty teenager. Basically. I don't get the sense that he's angry. I get the sense that he just craves attention. And that's always the driving factor here. Just pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. Right. It's like only child, only child, like narcissism. Yes. You know, yeah. And it's frankly kind of pathetic. And so it doesn't really come off very well when you hear the whole story. But we're going to get into it here because he was a super normal kid. Cartoons, Coca-Cola, ice cream. All that kind of shit. Nothing crazy is going on here. He attends Heritage Christian School from the second grade on, which is like a Baptist private school in Canton, Ohio. It's not cheap to send your kid to one of these schools. <laughs> yeah, right. Let, let me guess. Let me guess. Let me guess. Captain of the football team. No, he did play <laughs> yeah. football, but he sucked at football. I'd love to see that footage. <laughs> yeah. 
So he played football. He was a receiver, but he wasn't very good at football. And Canton, Ohio is actually, I believe, the home of the Football Hall of Fame. So football's really big there. So big there everybody yeah. was really into football. And he tried to play football, but he just sucked at it. And he kind of realized he wasn't going to get attention playing football, so he stopped playing football. He didn't fit in the best at school because, you know, Heritage is this Baptist Christian school. It's a very conservative evangelical school. It's the kind of place that's like, dancing is a sin. And so pretty hardcore. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't fit in with the other students. He also didn't really fit in with the faculty at the school because he was always that kind of kid who would try to antagonize the teacher and not do crazy shit, but he would just always try to ask those provocative questions and be the one who like, let's talk about what about what it says in revelations. Yes. Doesn't that contradict what it says in this? Okay. Brian. Yeah. And the teacher, Brian, yeah, they're like Brian. Dude, I'm just trying to fucking. Get like, I'm making day. ten grand a year here. Can you shut the fuck up? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the core, which is the story of John the Baptist. Yes, shut your mouth. Yes, I have written this curriculum. I'm not changing it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so he was also that he would write like six 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 on his Bible study books and stuff <laughs> like that to try to freak out his teachers, and they'd be like, "Oh, who did this?" <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, at one point. He decided that he wanted to make his own version of Mad Magazine because that was he was really into Mad Magazine. And so he made it so subversive. I know, right? (laughs) Al Jaffe's comics are just unassailably (laughs) harsh, cutting (laughs) political critiques. Okay. I will stand by that till the day I die. (laughs) I'm pretty sure it is Al Jaffe is actually a well done. I think a listener, a Mad Magazine (laughs) listener, please double check us on that. So he ends up getting in trouble for this and gets taken to the principal's office and is actually spanked because they had corporal punishment at this school, oh, which is a be. bygone era. Yes. Now that I can get behind. No, <laughs> it might have been the development of a couple of kinks that come up later. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and right, you scratch know, my comment from the record. <laughs> <laughs> In quite possibly the least surprising fact of all time, he was super into Dungeons and Dragons as a kid, and his parents would buy him hundreds of little pewter figurines, and then he would meticulously decorate each one. And everybody who knew him said that he never did anything halfway. If he was into something, he was all the way into it, just that kind oh, of okay. personality. And so he couldn't just have a couple of figurines. He had to have a hundred, and they all had to be like, meticulously decorated and a huge backstory that was involved in all of his Dungeons and Dragons games. So this is the early eighties and that is actually right when there started to be a moral panic around Dungeons and Dragons. So oh, he has the satanic this panic of yes. the eighties. Yeah. The wicked yeah. dice <laughs> <laughs> led to that early Tom Hanks movie. I believe he was in like an early Dungeons and Dragons movie in the early eighties. Anyway, <laughs> so he has this one hobby that he really likes, and then all of a sudden it just turns into this thing that you're into is evil, it's the devil. And he's kind of like, Well, I don't really understand that. It's just a weird game about guys going through dungeons and fighting goblins and shit like that. It's the nerdiest thing right. in the universe. And you're telling me that this is somehow subversive. Okay. Very shortly after that, it turns out that people at his school were in this whole satanic panic mode, made them sign a contract that said stuff like, I'm not going to play Dungeons and Dragons. It also said, I'm not going to listen to rock and roll music. And he was actually super into rock and roll music. He loved Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, Ozzy. You know, he's a huge Kiss fan. And less that's very effective, think, by the way, getting kids to like sign that they won't do something like that's oh, right. to work. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is like the logic those, of the 80s, man. Yeah, exactly. It's like this purity rings each and every time those work. <laughs> so, by the way, just in case you think that him listening to like Sabbath and Judas Priest and stuff was in any way rebellious, it was absolutely not. His parents were into it and they would take him to concerts. In <laughs> fact, his dad even went to Kiss concerts with him in full Kiss regalia, like the most supportive 
household that you could yeah. possibly imagine dude that's uh, crazy that it started it started to come together the the uh the <laughs> costume face paint you know he didn't go full kitty cat like their drummer but <laughs> yeah. well, well, the D thing is isn't <laughs> The D and D thing does actually track with that because it is, you know, depending on how far you take it, you know, I, I dabbled in it very briefly growing up, but you can go into, I mean, you can, you become these characters and you, it's, it's very immersive. And so that, that definitely tracks. Yeah. So he was again, super spoiled. His parents just got him whatever he wanted. And I saw interviews of people who knew him as a kid and they're all like, Oh yeah. Just like, he was the kid who he was in the kiss. And so his parents bought him all the official kiss makeup Mark, kits, all the gear and he and had the all the costumes and, and yeah, the blood the capsules base. for the mouth and stuff like that. No, not a bass. Cause he didn't play any fucking instruments. Cause he has a musical talent, but <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about bass here. I mean, let's... yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fair but he also, because he was spoiled and his parents, and again, only child, so less to spend money on. Because if any of you out there don't have children, they're not cheap. And so if you only have one, it helps to, you know, make the budget spread a little bit farther. But he also was the only kid in his town that he knew that had cable. And so he was the MTV kid. So he oh. would watch the shit out of MTV. Yep. And his parents kind of had no rules. So he would just watch MTV whenever he wanted to got super into David Bowie and loved his visual style. And again, the costumery, the face painting, all that stuff. You can see how this all dovetails into his later persona, but not the way you think it's going to. So anyway, we'll get to that a little bit later. Foreshadowing. Yeah. So he eventually convinces his parents when he is in the 10th grade that he does not fit in at this Christian school. It's just hold the back, man. He's got to be himself. He's a butterfly. Let him spread his wings. And so they say, okay, fine. They let him go to the local public high school where he doesn't fit in. He's, he's the weird no. fucking kid who just came from the high class Christian school. And they've all been going to school together since like kindergarten. And they're like, who the fuck is this weirdo? And so he's kind of just a loner again, interested in doing writing and art classes. One of the interesting anecdotes that I heard is apparently, again, this just goes to show, think, think about us as kids. And we're a little younger than him, but think about this. At some point, he had acne, and a dermatologist said, well, you know, sunlight and, like, UV is good for acne. So his parents bought him a tanning bed for the house, and so and he would tan in the house. So he had a year-long, like, bronze tan. Instead of just going outside, by the way. <laughs> That's how averse he is to outside play. Whoa. I feel like if I had like a if I broke my arm, I would not go to the hospital because of the fucking go bed. <laughs> seriously, <laughs> seriously. Is he wait? Is he not like sixty five? He looks he, old as hell. No, he, he's I've older seen. than us, but he was born About in ten years. Yes, yeah. he's born in sixty nine, so uh, he's 69. like eleven years yeah. old. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, but again, just imagine, like to this day, if one of my kids. Their dermatologist said they need a tanning bed. I'm like, well, they're just gonna have fucking acne. I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, I am yeah. not buying a tanning bed for my child. That's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he was very concerned with his look. Apparently, he was always like teasing up his hair and like super conscious of his look and his image, which in high school didn't matter because he was a huge nerd and nobody liked him. <laughs> Maybe in an attempt to get people to like him. His parents were the cool parents. They were the, well, you're going to drink somewhere. We'd rather have it be here where we know sure. what's going on. And so his parents would buy beer for Brian and his friends. And Dude. He, that's ridiculous, right? Spoiled Who does that? Unc uh, oh, my God. I'm, I'm all right with that part of things. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean that. That doesn't tend to lead to your kid having very good boundaries. There's something to be sure. gained from the process of sneaking around your parents <laughs> and trying to Legit. get away with shit, you know? Yeah, yep. 
because yeah, then cool. you would get caught for something and yeah you, but imagine being in a household where basically everything you did was met with oh, okay that's fine and you're just like i just want controversy pay attention to me i'm evil oh, and they're like oh you're so sweet this oh is getting yeah deep, dude this is getting deep right that totally. leads you to become more and more and more extreme so that you get a reaction because yeah. it's, the reaction is always the same of like, oh, okay, that's so sweet. Good that and Brian you, has friends. <laughs> even getting shit faced in the basement. This is fantastic. Like, you know, and you only get it as it gets more extreme as yeah. well. Like the thing about Justin Bieber was having threesomes at age thirteen or something. So you look at him as an adult, and you're like, what is he into now? In order to get a thrill, if he was doing that when he was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Wow. That's like that's like that's like every thirteen year old's. Uh dream <laughs> adam how do you know about justin bieber's 13 year old sex habits what, well, are you reading you know, tiger beat over here i have my own little thing that i do it's teen vogue thank you okay. And, <laughs> okay okay i often write into the editor so you can go find my handiwork there as well <laughs> so brian graduates from high school he's in canton ohio and all of a sudden his dad gets a job offer in fort lauderdale and he's like, oh, man, that seems like a better environment than Canton, Ohio. So the whole family packs up and moves to Fort Lauderdale. When I saw that Marilyn Manson, the band, was created in Florida, I assumed that Brian growing up in Ohio meant that he like had to get out and rebel. No, he moved with his parents down to Florida. <laughs> and How so they old all did you have his age? How old was he when they did this move? This is 18. He just graduated from high school. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's the time where you expect you're going to strike out on your own. And no, right, just still yeah. with mom and dad. Yeah. Move fine. to New York City. Exactly. That's what you, or LA or something like that. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what you kind nah, of expect. You got you to gotta stick with the gravy train. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> exactly. The, that's the path. <laughs> like my parents buy me beer and all my kiss makeup and they still beds. buy me my, <laughs> my D&D figurines. And so, you know. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. Look, this acne's not going to take care of itself if I don't go to <laughs> you know, Florida here. Right. Let me guess. They, they bought him studio time with Trent Reznor as well. Uh, well no, no. We're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. This is, this is not quite a Gary Newman type situation. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. the Good parents are funding back. all of the <laughs> demos and everything like that. So right, right. he goes down to Ohio. He enrolls in the junior college there. He studies journalism. He writes for the school paper there, but he also gets a job writing for a local magazine called 25th Parallel, which is focused on the Florida scene. It's kind of not alternative, but it's it's about music and culture and stuff like that. So he gets a job writing there and he writes there for a while. He actually gets to interview Trent Reznor for this magazine when Nine Inch Nails are coming to town. And so he interviews Trent Reznor, and he's like, me and Trent are best friends. Trent loves me. And all the people are like, yeah, sure, dude. Sure he does. Trent does not fucking know who you are. <laughs> but it inspires him to get into writing poetry to try to scratch that itch because he sees Trent Reznor getting all this adulation. And Trent Reznor is this dangerous kind of persona. And so he's like, yeah, I really – I want to do that too. I'm going to be a poet. And then he pretty quickly realizes that nobody gives a shit about poetry. And also he's not very good at poetry and going to do poetry readings is not going to get you girls or attention or fame or anything like that. And so he says, Hey, you know what? I'm going to start a band. At this point, he plays no instruments. He's never shown any indication that he has any musical talent and spoiler. He doesn't, <laughs> but he is friends with a guy who does play the guitar. That guy's name is Scott Pateski, and he is a guitar player, and we're going to level set here. This is 1989. Brian is 20 years old. He's friends with Scott, who's 21, and they are convinced that they want to start a band. And so what's the first thing that you do when you're like, I want to start a band? Do you write songs? Do you- You're going to pack your smokes. Try to recruit start. other yeah. musicians? Uh, uh, or, uh, let me guess. Uh, photo, photo shoot. Photo shoot. Photo <laughs> shoot. <laughs> Not even photo shoot. They just start talking about like the concept of the band. Oh god! What's the band's organizing concept going to be? <laughs> now, for astute listeners of the podcast, you will remember in the Slipknot episode, we talked about how the guys spent the main three guys spent like a year 
when one of the dudes worked at a gas station late at night and they would just sit around and talk about, well, what's the band's purpose going to be? What's our like ethos going to be? You know, what's our look going to be? No, no talk about the music. This is very much a similar thing where they got together and they talked about everything about the band except the music. The music was really an afterthought here. And I don't right, think right. that it is. I don't think that it is a coincidence that you get a band like Slipknot whose music is whatever. It's not terrible, but it's not it's great. It's an afterthought. An afterthought. It's like when Homer Simpson starts his business and he gets like his pencils and and his uh, desk and he's trying to and he's trying to figure out what the name of it should be and he's like interslice. It's like that's basically what he was doing, but there's no business. Well, that's one of the guys who was his editor at the newspaper that or the magazine that he worked at said, at that point, I don't think he cared about the product. He just wanted to sell it. And so it was sort of, what can we sell? Mm -hmm. Whatever we can sell, that's what we're going to do. And so that basically, you know, those late night chat sessions about cartoons, drugs, serial killers, all that normal stuff. That is when they form the nugget of the band that will become Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids, which was their original name, which is a really terrible name compared to Marilyn Manson, which, if I'm being honest, is a pretty damn good name. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty good. That. It's pretty good. So he convinces the magazine that he works at, the 25th Parallel, to write a two page article on the band Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids, despite never having played a show and having recorded no music. And essentially at that point, being just a guy with a guitar and a guy who writes poetry. I was going to say, is there, are there any other members or is it just the two guys? It's just the two guys at this point. They might, you know, they might've had a third guy at this point. They might've had their original bass player at this point, but there was just the three of them for a while. So I I wonder how much they, time they spent burying any evidence of like early recordings. (laughs) There weren't really any recordings. Uh, They didn't, They didn't really play a whole bunch of shows in this early iteration. So the magazine, the editor says like, yeah, sure, whatever. We'll have an intern write the article. And so the intern writes the article. And then Brian goes to the editor and says, do you think I can maybe like like make a few changes to this? He he rewrites the entire article. And just it turns into this jack me off puff piece about how Marilyn Manson is going to take over the fucking world and how amazing and cutting edge and innovative they are. And I'm like, I'm like honestly, the gall and the balls to do That's that. That's pretty is incredible. Kind of I yeah, actually yeah. respect that. I know that we talked with the guests who where they put out their first album was like hinting that they're actually the Beatles. Was, yeah, you got to have some balls to do that. Good for him. Man. Yeah. Who I don't have any respect for is the editor of that magazine, because, listen, I understand you're a magazine about culture in Southern Florida. It's not winning you a Pulitzer or anything, but you have to have some kind of integrity. You don't let the guy that the article is about (laughs) write the the article. article. (laughs) Yeah. Come on. Have some respect for your publication. And so... That ends up getting... How they get through the fact checkers. You know, that's... Yeah, right, right. (laughs) Exactly. So... That ends up getting them a little bit of buzz and they end up booking their first show. And the guy who was the editor of the magazine said he went to the first show and he said, I was, quote, embarrassed for them because they were terrible. (laughs) It was a bass player, a guitar player, Marilyn Manson singing and a drum machine. And at this time, Marilyn Manson is just like a long haired skinny dude in like a Hawaiian shirt and shorts. No, (laughs) it's not (laughs) Marilyn Manson with the latex and the face paint and shit. He's just some fucking skinny dork. (laughs) Like who kind of can't sing kind of singing on stage and apparently had zero charisma would like hide behind the microphone and wouldn't make eye contact with the crowd. And people were just like, what? the fuck is this like why am i here i don't understand what the point of this entire endeavor is the the more i'm hearing about this this is the most one of the more unlikely success stories that i can possibly think of like having yeah it's i'm flabbergasted 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it to start to make sense. And so, so far, it's not making sense. So far, it is not making sense. I think it might make sense at some point, but also, frankly, I still don't think it makes a ton of sense, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. So I they're a trio yeah. at this time. They're a bass, guitar, singer, no drums. As all good trios are. Bass, guitar, now, singer, now, no drums. Now are, now are, the, now are these uh, members... Are, do they continue to be members throughout the release of the album we're discussing? Well, Marty, we're going to touch on that. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we're going to touch on that. I got a story, Marty, got a story it, to tell it, you. We, we suffer I through the album. Shit. You can suffer got, through the next story, too. I got shit to do, man. <laughs> Monday. <laughs> All right. So, we have our three players right now. They've all taken names that are the first name of an iconic woman and the last name of a serial killer. So, we have Marilyn Manson. Daisy Berkowitz on guitar, who's Scott Pateski, and Olivia Newton Bundy, <laughs> who was then promptly kicked out of the band and replaced <laughs> with Gidget Gain, whose real name is Brad Stewart. Brad Stewart's on bass. So Brad is apparently very flamboyant and dresses in a very kind of provocative style, eyeliner, crazy outfits, and stuff like that. And Brian is like, oh, that's a good idea. I should do that. And then he starts asking for fashion advice from Brad. And he is basically changes his style to really mimic Brad's style. And so they go from this kind of like weirdly dressed, like you're a Florida tourist band to somebody who at least has something visually interesting about them. And they end up picking up a keyboardist named Madonna Wayne Gacy, Stephen Beyer, and they play around for a few years as a quartet with a drum machine. So they started in 1989. They're playing as a quartet. Again, no drummer. There's a drum machine. And they said like it literally was just like a drum machine on a stool would be the visual presentation that they had of it. Uh, but they in 1991 they recruit a drummer Sarah Lee Lucas whose real name is Fred Striegenhorst, and that, so, might have been a, that might have been a strategic name change. <laughs> yeah, I think they're all kind of strategic name changes. All right, so apparently Brian is a shameless and unrelenting self promoter, and he would just be constantly going to the shows on the scene going to your show, handing out flyers for his show, standing out in front of bars, handing out flyers. He is constantly insinuating himself into the scene. And eventually that gets the attention of Trent Reznor. Jeez. Who kind of remembers him from interviewing him from back in the day. Oh, And it's like, Hey, this is kind of interesting. Let me check these guys out. He checks out a show and in 1993, wait, in Florida, in Florida, in fucking Florida, they're still playing in Florida in clubs. I, I think this is the gap. This is the gap that needs to be explained here. <laughs> I mean, Trent Reznor is torn all over at the time, and I guess so. Yeah, most yeah. importantly, Trent Reznor has just been signed to Interscope Records, and the condition that he signed with Interscope was: I get my own carve out label, and I can sign whoever the fuck I want. And Whoa. Okay. So he has underneath Interscope Records, they gave him Nothing Records. And Nothing Records is going to be Trent Reznor's production company. And so he's looking for talent. And the very first act that they sign is Marilyn Manson in 1993. Wow. And he offers them a spot opening for them on their national tour. And to hear... The other members of the band say it. They're like, we were like a nobody fucking band playing in clubs. And then we're opening for Nine Inch Nails like a week later on a national. Jeez. So he's just playing Kingmaker basically because it yes. sounds like, look, I mean, by all accounts, I, I haven't heard what they sounded like back then. But I mean, they couldn't have been good. But they were not, he saw they were something not and they ended up being a huge hit. So like in his mind, he's probably like, oh, yeah, man, I from a business sense, it sounds like it worked out, but I, I also am just the thread you're connecting the dots, but I, I, I don't get it, man. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. I think that, and I don't have any quotes from Trent Reznor to back this up, but I think that 
if you've listened to Nine Inch Nails, Nine Inch Nails is an industrial band. They have a dark, angular, edgy sound. Hold on a second. My fucking cat is meowing. Go away. I cannot feed you. Stop meowing. You're getting on tape. Um, so if you've listened to Nine Inch Nails as a band, they have this. Jesus Christ, Minnie, get out of here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So if you've listened to Nine Inch, I love that you fly around the country with a cat. I drove across the country with my cat. Cat's still traumatized from the the drive. They're actually they're doing all right. They're a little pissed at me, but it's okay. So again, I don't have any quotes from Trent Reznor to actually back this up, but if you listen to Nine Inch Nails, they have an industrial, angular, kind of angry sound. They are also a visual band that took advantage of MTV to make these kind of dark and edgy and freaking out people videos. And I think he saw Marilyn Manson as a template that he could then take and put his expertise on top of and improve because they had the visual. They had the intensity and he's like, well, I can make good music. So like we'll just figure the rest of this shit out. Like, but you have the look, yeah, yeah. You have the vibe. You have the catchy name. I can make this work. And so that's my assumption of why Trent Reznor chose to sign them again as his first signing on Nothing Records. And so he gets signed. They go on tour with him, and then they go into the studio in July of 1993, and they record the Manson Family album. Now, Trent Reznor is not super involved in this. It's actually produced by Raleigh Mossaman, who had produced a bunch of the Swans albums, who people keep writing in and telling us how good Swans are, and I have not heard any of the material that you're saying is good. And I've listened to some of the songs that people have suggested as being the good Swan songs, so I don't know what's going on with that. But apparently, he's not a very good producer because everybody says that this album sucks. Nobody likes it. (laughs) Trent Reznor hates it. Wait, Portrait of an American Family? No. Uh, it is called the sorry. Manson Family Album. Uh, Manson Family. I knew it had family in it. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. So it's flat. It doesn't catch the spirit of the band. It just sounds super ho-hum. Also, their bassist, Brad, is sinking deeper into a heroin addiction at this time. And Trent Reznor says, hey, listen, I just signed you. You're my first signing. I really believe in you. And so... Let's rework this album. He flies them out to LA to basically re-record and redo the entire album. Jeez. So they end up kicking Brad out of the band after recording the Manson family album, but before going to LA to try to rework the album. And they get Twiggy Ramirez, whose real name is Jordy White. So he joins the band and they go out to LA to help re-record and reimagine this album. And just on a quick side note, like Marilyn Manson is clearly the best name in the band, but Twiggy Ramirez, I think that's pretty good too. I remember Twiggy as like a personality that you would hear about being in Marilyn Manson at the time. So So wait, Twiggy, Twiggy is like a famous. She was a, she, well, she was a famous model in, I believe the sixties and she was really thin. And that okay. was kind of the... Oh, because they, well, they call her Twiggy, I guess. Well, they call her Twiggy. So, But I remember Twiggy from Marilyn Manson being kind of like a personality that you'd see on MTV in a dress and looking all weird. Right, right, yeah. So anyway, they spend seven weeks re-recording and remixing this album in LA, and they retitle it Portrait of an American Family. And then it is re-released on Interscope Records in July 1994. And it actually ends up doing pretty well. It peaks at number 34 on the Heat Seekers charts. And we've talked about this before. Heat Seekers charts are for bands that have not charted before. So they get on the Heat Seeker charts at 34. And they have a single called Get Your Gun. I don't know if you guys remember this. I remember this from back in the day. It was kind of a low-budget music video, but it, it was shot in a very close up on the face while the band's kind of playing way. And it was kind of controversial because they're talking about guns and it's the mid nineties. And so 
it gets so real quick, real, real, real quick. I, I listened to this album. I don't know if anyone else did. Portrait of an American Family. But, yeah, uh, and I'll say this is probably their peak. Oh, I you know, you know what? what? I actually kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not terrible. It's not terrible. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Maybe there's a lesson the here. <laughs> the lesson I'm walking away with is we need to go back and re-record all of our shitty records that, that we made back in the day and uh, just keep yeah. trying and trying and uh, right. just get Trent Reznor to put us up for seven weeks in LA with unlimited yeah. studio time and then we'll just re-record all of our stuff. It'll be great. Yeah. It can't be that hard. So this gets them the ability to do a tour as a national headliner in 1995. During this time, they end up kicking their drummer, Sarah Lee Lucas, out of the band, and they recruit a drummer, Kenneth Wilson, who goes by Ginger Fish. So we're going to level set again. At this point, the band is Brian, Scott, Steve, Jordy, and Kenny. That is Marilyn Manson at this time. They go back to the studio. This time, Trent Reznor has opened his own studio in New Orleans, and they record what will become Smells Like Children which was released in October 24th, 1995. And this is the one that had their cover of the Eurythmics, of the Eurythmics song, Sweet Dreams Are Made of This. And this will be evidence. This will be evidence in his, uh, his court hearing. Yeah. Now let me ask you guys one question. Do you notice anything about the release date of October 24th, 1995? If they waited one goddamn week, it would have been Halloween. I mean, Halloween, yeah. And they could have the released it on Halloween. Date of the year. Come on, oh, guys. What man. are you doing here? It was nah, right that's too there. cliche, though, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. They don't want to go cliche. <laughs> no, not not Marilyn me Manson. <laughs> oh, God. They wanted they wanted a week to have like the costumes, you know, printed and released for kids to wear. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. Everybody's got their dope head <laughs> costume that they're wearing. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're twiggy, they're twiggy get up. Yeah. <laughs> So, but listen, Marty, you're not super wrong because they are a very visual band and they make a video for Sweet Dreams, which shows off their kind of weird and aggressive look. And that becomes a big hit. It's heavy play on MTV and smells like children, which was not even intended to be a full length album. It was supposed to be like a reworking of a B-side ends up going platinum. So Marilyn Manson well, hit his album. One thing I'll say about this album, even though it's not the one we're talking about, they have a song called Shitty Chicken Gangbang. And and the shitty, the word shitty has little stars, so you can't tell that it oh, says yeah, shitty. Yeah. Yeah. But they also, the song before it is called Rock and Roll N-Word. And the N word oh, is Jesus. on full display. Oh, yeah, can't, can't say shitty though. Was fine with that. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so Did the shitty also have like a dollar sign as the S. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I am sorry to say that I bought this album back in the day. I did. And uh, I listened to it. And we'll it, forgive you. You know why? Because at the time you had that Ibanez and you refused to trim off the excess when you would change your strings <laughs> and it would be flying around poking people in the eyes. So yeah. I'll give that to you. It was an era. It was a style. You're did you also put like lit cigarettes in between the strings on the headstock? Because <laughs> like that's I fucking no, I did. That's the I, yeah. Yeah. I was say that. yeah. <laughs> did I? You mean, do I still currently? <laughs> <laughs> so... This album goes platinum. It's a big hit. And they want to capitalize on the success of Smells Like Children. So Smells Like Children is released in October of 1995. And in, I'm sorry, and in February of 1996, they go back in the studio. Because they're like, we just had a big hit. We got to capitalize on this. Let's get a fucking album done quick. And then they spend eight months in the studio. <laughs> recording this fucking album let's get something going how does over 77 minutes sound guys yeah let's go yeah yeah they had to get a bunch of like music instructors in to like teach them how to play <laughs> dude it's even worse than that. well it sounds like it was a it was like a, a mess of like an absolute fucking shit show so they're basically losing all focus on the musical aspect of being in a band brian specifically 
is not really all that interested in making music. He's writing his poetry, but he's not really participating in the writing of songs. It's just a vehicle for him to get attention. He kind of try to record some stuff and they get nothing useful out of it for the first several sessions. They apparently quote routinely destroy the studio and equipment and instruments and just racking up a fucking bill that they're going to have to pay back later. Like a bunch of goddamn idiots because your last hit was a song you didn't even write. So there's not that much money not coming, a lot in. coming in. Right. Yeah. I wonder what Trent Reznor was thinking when this is happening. Oh, well, I read one of the stories I read was that, that he actually, I don't know the, which guitar player it was, if there's many or if it was one, but that, uh, that Trent Reznor actually smashed one of the guitar players, guitars it at, as a way to like show him like, Oh no, this is how you, this is how you got to do it. It plays a few chords and then just smashes it. And apparently it was like a gift from the guy's dad or something like a oh, gift from the guy's dad who had just died. Oh no. Trent Reznor comes Sorry. off as a gigantic fucking asshole in this story <laughs> because basically there is two sides of this story. All right. There is the story that is told by Trent and Brian, and then there's a story that is told by Scott, who ends up leaving the band in the middle of recording this album. The story that is told by Trent and Brian is that Scott was creatively dried up. He couldn't write any new or good material. He's falling apart. He wasn't able to handle the pressure of being a rock star. Which, again, your hit song was a cover. So, like, get what off your are you high expecting? Horse. Yeah, get yeah, off your right. fucking high horse that they, your guitar player is now creatively bankrupt. The version that Scott tells is that Trent specifically made these sessions super chaotic and was always trying to instigate fights between band members. They were Rock all doing roll. a lot of drugs and also not sleeping, purposefully not sleeping. And it was a, this terrible environment where nobody was actually focusing on the music. And so there's all this animosity building up in the band and it culminates in, they basically just destroy all of Scott's equipment. And yes, you're right. Trent Reznor at one time is like, Oh yeah, let me show you how to play that. And just smashes the guitar that had just been a gift from his dead dad. And Scott leaves the band shortly thereafter. And the funny thing is the entire time that all this shit is going on, apparently Twiggy Jordy is like, I just want to make a fucking album. Can we just like write an album here? And he's actually working on writing songs and making an album. And Trent Reznor kind of works with him. Now, it seemed like there was a really weird dynamic. And the closest thing that I could ascertain, this is just my own completely armchair psychologist take on this, is that Brian and Trent were fucking nerds and bullied in high school. And then they get some they juice get there. and they become yep. the alpha dogs and they pick somebody to fucking pick on. And it just happened to be the guitar player Jeez. and they push him out of the band. And so the only one taking it seriously is Twiggy who gets a writing credit on 13 out of the 17 songs. And he ends up playing most of the, of the guitar on the album as well. But also, to try to salvage this fucking clown show, Trent Reznor comes in and he writes some of the songs. And he brings in guitar players from Nine Inch Nails. Which, that I understand a guitar player coming in, but they also bring in the drummer from Nine Inch Nails to play on some of the tracks. And so, kind like, if your drummer... Move. Yeah, if your drummer's not pulling his weight, like, that's... What the fuck is even going on there? Why is the drummer even there if he's not pulling his weight? Yeah... Huh. So this super chaotic eight month long saga where Brian is writing all the lyrics and has this mental idea of we're going to write a rock opera about a fascist figure in a rock star coming to power and destroying all of humanity but he's not really engaged in the writing of the songs. And I think that that's what led to this sort of disjointed nature of the album is that he had this quote unquote clear vision, but not didn't seem like the follow through to make it happen. And so it ends up becoming Antichrist Superstar. Now, Antichrist Superstar, again, it's a rock opera broken up into three movements. There's the Hierophant, 
inauguration of the worm and disintegrator rising. Oh. After eight months of putting this together, the album is released to almost universal acclaim on October 8th of 1996, reaches number three on the U.S. Billboard 200 and is just shy of going double platinum, selling 1.9 million copies in the U.S. Oh, my God. I think also, that's I feel like it, it needs to be mentioned because Marilyn Brian, I'm sorry, Brian really wants you to know that he was experimenting with self harm during this time and testing his pain tolerance and shoving needles in his fingers and what a dick. <laughs> yeah, I heard. Pay, I, we're paying attention. I get you broadcasting that right. Yeah. I, re I read an interview or something where he's talking about like, oh, I bonded with some of these bandmates. Twiggy, I think maybe specifically, he's like where. I needed to, I needed to hang with someone who understood like pain and suffering and what it felt like to have like broken glass all over yourself and it's like you fucking did that to yourself dude like yeah. what are you talking about yeah I don't know also, I don't want to minimize so that contrived. aspect of things but yeah it, do you want to call up uh, your super supportive mom and dad and have a nice <laughs> heart to heart with them about how you feel so unappreciated and uh, like, fucking whiner. I, I'm not making light of self harm by the way I feel like I need oh, to say that but like. Yes. The extent that these guys were, were like reveling in it in a way that was part of the uh, part of the persona in a way that yes. seems very disingenuous. Well, I think right, you could you could you could have been there for the guy, you know, Daisy Berkowitz that they kicked out who died of stage four colon cancer at age 49. Yeah, you could have you know, been there for him. Yes. But instead, you're just like, oh, that guy was creatively bankrupt. He didn't have anything on me. The genius that is Meryl Manson. <laughs> But Alan, to your point, I feel like they are trivializing self-harm by doing it like recreationally and being like, yeah, look at me. Look at As what a I'm selling doing. Point. You know? Like, yeah. 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 Like performative. Yeah. Yeah. I, yes. Great word. Yeah. Yeah. So just one last thing before we get into the music. You guys all listen to this on Spotify, I imagine, right? Yes. Did you ever yeah. scroll yes. down to see the about the artist picture? <laughs> For Marilyn Manson that they have was under there. cowboy hat on? No. It is the most photoshopped picture of a person I have ever seen in my entire life. It looks fucking cartoonish. And it's hilarious to me. Because, like, he's an old fat guy now. And so he has this, like, super feminine, like, trimmed. Oh, yeah. It looks, like a, it looks like a, it's like a cartoon. It's like, it's it looks like, like it's a like... cartoon. Yeah, it's like just draw a drawing, basically. With the yeah, blue eyeshadow. The blue eyeshadow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks yeah. like one of the robots from iRobot, where they just had yeah. like that clear white face. Yeah, and it's so kind of pathetic that it's oh, like, it's dude, like a gallery, yeah. You're like almost 60. Just be almost 60, man. Just like, own it. Yeah, just fucking own it. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't pretend that you're like some slender 24-year-old. Anyway, it's just the... It's just so pathetic. And that... Ugh, that's kind of what I was left with this entire album. I was just like, you guys are just kind of fucking pathetic. Anyway. I mean, his whole deal is an image that that's been the whole deal. Yes. And yeah, it, it makes sense that that would extend to, to now. Yeah. Well, we're going to dive in to the tracks on this album. You guys ready to talk about the actual music on this album? 